Hill Anti-Lynching Act was signed into law on March 29th, 2022. It's definitely good news, but it does feel a little surprising that it just happened. It's like finding out we just passed a law saying you can't light a daycare on fire. Like, how was that not already the law? The Anti-Lynching Act actually passed the House by a vote of 422 to 3 and passed the Senate by a unanimous consent. It sounds easy, so why did it take so long? The short answer, of course, is racism. The long answer is racism, but with more details. So <laughs> let's take a look at why it took Congress over a century to pass an anti-lynching bill and why it still matters. To do that, we need to go back to the beginning of the last century. You know, when it was totally normal to name your baby Herman, and people used to rock out to this. You think you can't twerk to that? You can twerk to that. <laughs> In the year 1900, the first anti-lynching bill was presented to Congress by George Henry White, a representative from North Carolina. Now, you might not be able to tell, but for his day and age, this man was a fox. In 2022, he's a three, but in 1900, he was an 11. Now, to set the scene, there had been unrest in White's district, which included Wilmington, North Carolina. Wilmington had a mostly black population and many black government officials. The black community there was filled with doctors and lawyers and people who owned prosperous businesses. And if you've ever seen this show before, I think you know where this is going. It's the same feeling you get when a white person is about to give their thoughts on the Will Smith, Chris Rock slap. It's gonna end poorly. <laughs> black families in Wilmington became successful and their white neighbors were not having it. So white supremacist groups in the area published something they called the White Declaration of Independence, which, correct me if I'm wrong here, is just the Declaration of Independence? <laughs> anyway, their version said that white men had to be given black men's jobs in businesses, which is insane. Basically, the business community in Wilmington was a lot like the word bay, created by black people, but as soon as it got big, white people had to find a way to ruin it. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. A white mob stormed through the streets of Wilmington, shooting into the homes and schools of black residents. They violently seized control of the government and installed unelected white people to replace black officials. Mobs ravaged the entire city, lynching anywhere from dozens to hundreds of black residents. That is the environment in which George Henry White introduced the first anti-lynching bill to Congress. As a black man who had just watched his constituents being lynched in the streets. And yet, the bill never made it out of committee. Congress refused to even have the conversation. When he left Congress a few years, a few years later, George Henry White would be the last black person in Congress for almost three decades. Because you know the old saying, once you go black, White people throw a huge tantrum and don't elect another black person for an entire generation. <laughs> Might not be catchy, but it's true. Now, that was just the first try. After the bill's failure, it took 20 years before another anti-lynching bill was introduced into Congress. This time, it took the work of the NAACP and a Missouri representative named Leonidas Dyer. Dyer also had seen attacks on his black constituents, including the East St. Louis race riots in which 38 African-American men, women, and children were murdered by a white mob. Dyer's bill did, it did actually make it out of committee and even passed in the House in 1922, but it was stalled by racists in Congress who claimed that the anti-lynching bill was, and I swear this is true, an act of legislative mob violence, which is insane. That's not just the pot calling the kettle black, it's the pot lynching the kettle and then complaining about pan-on-pan -pan violence. <laughs> Unfortunately, the stories go on like this for the next century. Anti-lynching bills emerged every decade or two, like cicadas or revivals of Annie. And, <laughs> and just like Annie, there were a lot of white guys embarrassing themselves by being on the wrong side of history. <laughs> Mr. Warbucks, you are an aging, bald guy constantly hitting on your much younger assistant. You are a cliche and a walking sexual harassment lawsuit. Find a woman who isn't your employee and stop asking everybody to call you daddy, you freaking creep. <laughs> the fact is, almost 200 anti-lynching bills were introduced in the first half of the 20th century. Seven presidents petitioned Congress to end lynching. Sometimes the bills would actually pass the House, but they always got blocked by the Senate. And by the way, you know how I know all that? 
because it's from the text of a resolution the Senate passed in 2005 apologizing for the fact that they never passed an anti-lynching bill. That's right, they passed a resolution apologizing for not passing an anti-lynching bill, but they still didn't pass an anti-lynching bill. That's nuts, man. It's like lifeguards apologizing to someone for all the shark attacks while the shark is still chewing off their leg. <laughs> Get your priorities straight. Now, you've probably noticed that I haven't really gotten into the details of lynching in this piece. Well, that's because once you talk about exactly what happened, it's hard to make jokes, but the details matter. More than 4,000 people were lynched in the United States between 1882 and 1968, and 99% of perpetrators escaped state or local punishment. The Equal Justice Initiative describes some of these lynchings as carnival-like events where vendors sold food, photographers printed postcards, and victims' clothing and body parts were given out as souvenirs. Lynching has basically been an open wound for our country. Yes, it hurts to deal with it, but it will get so much worse if we don't. The NAACP defines lynching as the public killing of an individual who has not received any due process. So yeah, that includes our ancestors who were hanged from trees, but it also includes modern day black people who were murdered while they were taking out their wallet, wearing a hoodie, or jogging in their neighborhood, or just minding their own dang business. The Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act was signed into law last month. All it took was 200 attempts, 122 years, and thousands upon thousands of lynchings. I'm glad it finally got passed, but we have to remember exactly how we got here. <laughs> Let's talk about museums. A great place to go if you want to seem classy while looking at naked people. <laughs> Our show is filmed in New York City, which is home to some of the best museums in the world, like the Met, the Museum of Modern Art, the Guggenheim, and of course, the Whitney which I recently discovered is not a shrine to Whitney Houston. <laughs> I wanted to dance with somebody while security guard was all like, ma'am, we're gonna have to ask you to leave, and that is fair. <laughs> but as much as I love museums, it's important to recognize that many of them have some real issues. As I mentioned, the Yale University Art Gallery recently had to surrender a bunch of its artifacts to law enforcement because they're being investigated as stolen goods. The art allegedly came from a smuggling ring that was responsible for the theft of objects valued at more than $145 million. So even though the museums or foundations paid for the artifacts, it turns out they don't actually own them. It's like if a guy stole my car and then sold it to someone else, the new owners still have to give me back my car and they should also have to detail it because it's full of crumbs. <laughs> so, this is a really clear-cut case. A guy allegedly stole a bunch of stuff, and when people realized it, the museums had to give the stuff back. But what if, instead of one person, it was entire countries doing the stealing? And what if museums have known for decades that they were displaying stolen goods? Because that's actually what's going on with museums all over the world. To explain, let me introduce you to the Royal Museum for Central Africa in Belgium. I know, I just heard myself say those words, too. <laughs> yep. That's not where a museum about Africa belongs. And the more you think about it, the worse it gets. So people from Belgium went to Africa, looked around and decided what's important, then they stole it, put it in a museum and showed it to their little friends. That's why when you watch Black Panther, some people think Eric Killmonger is the villain and some people think he's the guy making some good points. <laughs> now, a little background here. Yeah, I know. I cheered for him too in the theater. <laughs> but mostly for the haircut. His, his hair is untouchable. Now, a little background here. Back in the 1800s, Belgium was run by a guy named King Leopold II. On a side note, that man could absolutely go to a hipster party in Brooklyn tonight and not stand out in any way. Now, this Belgian hipster here decided he wanted part of Africa for himself, so he took it. And because he obviously didn't understand the concept of irony, he named it the Congo Free State, which is a little bit like calling Chuck E. Cheese the restaurant where no one ever pees in the ball pit. <laughs> it's just false advertising. Now, Leopold looted and destroyed everything he came into contact with in Africa, and because of his brutality, about half of the Congolese population died. Then, after stealing everything he could from the African people, he hired an architect to build, you guessed it, the Royal Museum for Central Africa, then proceeded to fill it with the stuff they stole from the Africans whose homes and families they had destroyed. And that's the museum still sitting there today, which is insane. That place has more of a haunted legacy than the basement in Get Out. Now, 
obviously, the Belgian Museum is an extreme example, but museums all over the world are proudly displaying stuff that was stolen from other cultures, which isn't that surprising. It turns out people in Egypt weren't like, yeah, girl, take my ancestor's mummified body and let second graders get peanut butter all over it on a field trip. <laughs> but however bad you're thinking all this is, it's actually worse. Because according to UNESCO, currently 90% to 95% of sub-Saharan cultural artifacts are housed outside of Africa. That's like finding out 95% of the real housewives in Atlanta live in Duluth. Now, <laughs> part of you might be saying, but isn't it good for people to see artifacts from other cultures? Aren't these museums doing a service? And the answer is sure, sort of. But even if you're doing something good, you don't get to do it with stolen stuff. Remember when someone stole my car earlier? Even if the new owners are really nice people who are using it to drive a bunch of nuns to choir practice, it is still not okay, but it is a fantastic idea for a Sister Act sequel. <laughs> now, I'm not saying you can't have objects from other cultures in your museums or that it's not important to be exposed to art from other places, but we do have to find out where those objects came from, return some artifacts to their proper owners, and display others in their appropriate context. And the good news is many museums today are really trying to improve. The Royal Museum for Central Africa even closed down for a few years to try to provide better context for their displays. The Museum of Man in San Diego announced that they would no longer display human remains without tribal consent, which is good news, but also, oh my God, they were doing that? That is the most disturbing San Diego-related news since we lost this woman. Where is she? Carmen, for the love of God, why can't you just settle down? But there's another way to make sure that art from people of color is ethically sourced. Get it straight from artists. Let's showcase more contemporary art from artists of color. And Finally, museums need more people of color in leadership positions. According to a 2015 study, only 16% of leadership positions at art museums are held by people of color. And it's not acceptable to have museum leadership that is only slightly more diverse than the cast of Young Sheldon. <laughs> museums have a rough past, but they can have a bright future. Many of them have the power and wealth necessary to start righting their wrongs and to establish a more equitable arts industry. So it's time for them to step up. And if they want to start with the Whitney Houston exhibit at the Whitney, I wouldn't be mad because I believe the children are our future. This has been How Did We Get Here? Police shootings are one of those things you need to talk about even though you don't really want to, like prostate health or the fact that Mamma Mia is really just a musical episode of Maury. White privilege is having three men who might be your baby daddy and still somehow getting played by Meryl Streep. So, Tonight, we're not gonna go into the details of the latest horrific police shooting. Instead, we'll step back and talk about a bigger question. Why don't black people just comply with the police? Now, there are a million reasons why a person might not comply in any given situation, but we are only going to focus on two, okay? The first is easy. When black people encounter the police, they're often terrified. If you're a black person in America, you've seen a million viral videos of black people being murdered by the police. So when you see the police, even if you've done nothing wrong, you can feel like you are in danger. And when you're in danger, you want to get out of danger, which is why running can seem like a good option. Now, it can be hard for some white people to understand being scared of cops. Maybe in your life, the police have always been there to help you. And it's hard to believe that that's not true for everyone. It's like finding out that the life jacket you use to keep you afloat is actually a lead vest when put on someone else. And for black people, the different treatment by police isn't just perception, it's reality. Findings from New York City's stop and frisk data shows that compared to white residents, black residents are 17% more likely to experience police use of hands, 18% more likely to be pushed into walls or the ground, 24% more likely to have a weapon pointed at them, and 25% more likely to be pepper sprayed or hit by a baton. So it makes perfect sense that black people are fearful of police. And you act irrationally when you think something is going to cause you pain. It's the same reason I scream every time I see a hot comb. Ah, oh, my ear. <laughs> and it gets worse. According to a 2019 study, black men are more than three times more likely to be killed by police over the course of their lifetime than white men. So when a black man gets stopped by police and runs, that's actually pretty rational. But if it's still hard for white people to understand, here's another way to think about it. What if 
Black people react to police the same way white people react to black people. <laughs> Studies have repeatedly shown that white people perceive black people as more violent and more likely to commit crimes, even though that's not true. In one study where white participants were shown a slideshow of random people's faces, black males were seen as more threatening than white males, which is horrible. The only time looking at a face should be threatening is when you come across a coworker on Hinge. Do you swipe right to be nice? Do you swipe left to make it less awkward? Neither. You quit your job and you leave the country. But the racism doesn't stop at faces. A University of Wisconsin study found that when people consider how dangerous a neighborhood is, they don't base it on the crime rate. They base it on how much of the population is young black men. That's right. If there are young black men, then it is automatically dangerous, which is insane. If that were accurate, the scariest place in America would have been the set of a different world. <laughs> and hey, feelings are just feelings, except for one tiny thing. When white people feel like they're in danger, they call the police, those very same police who are killing black men at over three times the rate of white men. White people love calling the cops so much you would think they'd have a punch card where the 10th call gets them a free sandwich. And Let's be honest, maybe there is a certain kind of white person that just likes to stir things up. Hmm, who am I thinking of? Sophie. Girl, you invited all three dads to a weird island when you could have just sent them an email and you didn't even tell your mom? Girl, you don't want a wedding. You want drama. <laughs> now, it's important to note that white people don't call the police on everyone. One study of a mostly white community in Austin, Texas, found that when residents saw a suspicious person who was black, they called the police 60% of the time and only 10% of the time when they were white. Basically, white people decide black people are dangerous, so they call the cops. Black people understand the inherent danger of interacting with cops, so they freak out. And when they freak out, the cops decide they're dangerous. It's a cycle of fear that keeps leading back to black people getting killed. But all this is just part of the reason why a black person might not comply with the police. The second part of that is complying doesn't guarantee your safety. Since 2015, 625 black people were running away from the police when they were shot and killed, which is terrifying. But even scarier, 875 of them weren't. The fact is, sometimes running away gets you killed and sometimes staying still also gets you killed. Now, I'm a black lady who grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. I do not have the time to tell you about all my police run-ins. Wait, maybe I do. Those mother have pulled a gun on me multiple times. A gun. On this. <laughs> so the next time someone asks why black people don't just comply with the police, feel free to tell them exactly how we got here. Tonight, we're gonna talk about foster care. So just so we're all on the same page, Foster care is when, for any number of reasons, a kid is cared for by the state instead of by their parents. Foster care is not a secret system to care for the safety and security of Broadway legend Sutton Foster. <laughs> now, foster care is important. We need a child welfare system to take kids out of dangerous and abusive homes and keep them safe. But it's also important to point out that the system is not the same for everyone. For example, in Los Angeles County, black kids account for only 7% of the population, but are 24% of child welfare services population, which is insane. Black people haven't been this overrepresented since TV shows figured out they could cast us as therapists. <laughs> 500 black therapists on TV, three in real life. <laughs> now, those numbers mean there are a lot of black kids who are being taken from their families. And removing black people from their homes obviously isn't new to America. It's the foundation of slavery and also what happens early on in most seasons of The Bachelor. Girl, <laughs> you were never gonna get to stay in that house. <sighs> but in real life, our country has a long history of taking kids from their families. And it's not just black kids. All the way back to the late 1800s, hundreds of thousands of Native Americans and indigenous children were taken from their homes so that they could be, quote unquote, civilized by white people. Now, just a reminder, in the 1800s, white people were forcing women to wear these. Also, in the 1800s, a white guy, and I swear I'm not making this up, patented this actual mousetrap with a loaded gun. <laughs> That's real. So, honestly, civilized white people had so many bad ideas, it's amazing there are any left. <laughs> now, 
The trend of taking away Native kids to live with white people continued for decades. In studies from 1969 and 1974, the Association on American Indian Affairs found that 25 to 35% of all Native children had been separated from their families and put into the foster care system or adopted. And 90% were placed in non-Indian homes, and that's just horrifying. Uh, Uprooting a kid and placing them with someone of a totally different background should be a last resort. Unless that kid is a scrappy redheaded orphan. (laughs) She'll do fine. And she'll make you realize you're in love with your secretary. (laughs) Now, part of you might be saying, hey, maybe these Native kids were actually sent to places that were safer. I wish that were true. Unfortunately, the reality is many of them were sent to schools where they were treated so poorly that thousands of them died from abuse and poor living conditions. The last of those schools didn't close until the late 1990s, which is shocking. I thought the worst thing happening in the 90s was Blues Traveler. (laughs) That shit was fine for like one or two songs, but this band went on multiple tours and that is unacceptable. (laughs) Now, Things have gotten better since then, but even today, Native children are four times more likely to be removed from their families than white children are from theirs. So the question is, why? Why are Black and Native children being removed from their homes so much more than white kids? Well, the first reason is easy. It's because they're being investigated more often. According to a recent study in the American Journal of Public Health, half of Black children, as well as half of Native American children, experienced a Child Protective Services investigation at some point in the first 18 years of their lives. 18 years of getting the runaround. Oh, runaround! I take it back. Blues Traveler is actually pretty great. (laughs) But hey, maybe the investigations are necessary. After all, we don't want a child staying in an abusive home. But here's the thing. The overwhelming majority of child removals do not even allege abuse. In fact, it actually turns out that most charges against parents have to do with one thing, poverty. That's right. People are literally having their children taken away because they are poor, which is terrible. If money made you a good parent, then succession would be a comedy about four well-adjusted kids. (laughs) Now, foster care agencies have little incentive to fix things. That's at least partially because America has started using privatized foster care. That's right. In maybe the most terrifyingly American thing ever, our country has turned taking kids away from their parents into a business. And the more kids in the system, the more that business profits. Unsurprisingly, it ain't going well. A bipartisan congressional report found that for-profit foster care agencies had, quote, abuse, neglect, and system failures at every level, which, by the way, is also the official slogan for the Catholic Church. (laughs) The good news is there... Everybody went, oh! I see. I remember what you're talking about. The good news is there are some solutions. Counties in California and New York have been trying something called a blind removal program. And no, it's not to remove the blinds from your white neighbor that she uses to peek through while she's calling the police. Mm, Looks like they're having some sort of cookout and they're using a suspicious substance called seasoning. I'm gonna call 911. (laughs) Blind removal is actually a program where caseworkers don't disclose the race of a family when making decisions about whether or not to remove the children. And so far, it seems to help out a lot. New York's Nassau County reported that five years after removing race from the deliberations, 21% of children in foster care were black, compared with 57% before blind removal, which makes it pretty clear that a whole lot of black kids were being removed from their homes for no other reason than the fact that they were black. The fact is we need to find a way to protect black and native kids from abuse while also removing the bias from the system. Now that means taking race out of the equation and also telling our government to stop the privatization of foster care. Oh, and last but not least, we need to get some more black therapists because these kids are gonna need them. This has been How Did We Get Here? 